All right, hey there, everyone. Uh, this week's video is um, the first week beginning this new module in language and thought, uh, where we're looking at environments as persuasive, right? So the first section uh, of the class was on basic, simple stuff, general semantics. The second section was about kind of extending and complicating some of those assumptions and bringing in additional things to consider, uh, media, language, there's, there's, it's not so clean, right? This uh, third section, we're kind of pushing that, that exploration a little bit further to, to be entertaining this idea that the entire kind of social scenery that we find ourselves immersed in constantly is beset by potentially misleading, inaccurate, uh, willfully distorted messaging, words, language, news reports, all, you know, all of it that's, that's coming at us, that verbal processing world that we've been talking about, um, is potentially compromising our thought processes if we maintain that the goal at all times is to be thinking absolutely clearly about objective truth and reality as it is. This is, again, of course, serious man kind of uh, uh, thought process here. Um, and if that's our goal, then we can't help but be mortified and horrified by so much of what's just flying around us all the time, what counts as reporting or authoritative statements about things, writing that we find in, well, back when they were writing more like newspapers or on the news. But now think about, you know, with the addition of the social media platforms, it's like everything that has been said before them just add like, you know, 20 more orders of magnitude. It just sort of accelerates and amplifies the, the worst tendencies of the kind of stuff we're looking at here. So I'm going to do Lutz and Orwell together because, uh, they're just so similar in terms of what they're saying, where they're going, what they're sort of frustrated by. Um, I'll start with, um, I'm going to start with Lutz, I think. It's a little bit easier to get into. So William Lutz, this is, um, sorry, I didn't get the exact publication date, but this is more recent to our times. And if you look through the little bio on the first page here, you'll notice that William Lutz actually got, um, a degree at Reno, UNR. So that's cool. So he's a pretty major voice in this, you know, there's an ongoing cottage industry, Orwell, Lutz, a few other kind of major public intellectual figures who write in a frustrated way about, you know, where we're at with our language use, with our thought processes. And, and um, you know, you can do do well in terms of publishing and having a publishing career by kind of going at that uh, that question and that problem. So Lutz is is pretty well known in this world of double speak. I think he coined that that phrase even. And so we'll start there and then we'll jump back about three decades and go to England across the pond, as they say, to Orwell, British essayist, um, very well known for his essays, but also his fictional stuff, Animal Farm might be familiar to you, right? So Orwell is a very well-known English essayist and writer from the middle to later part of the last century. Um, and Orwell, sorry, and Lutz is, is a little bit more contemporary, but the concerns are very consistent and even a lot of the language that they're using is, is quite consistent. So should be able to move pretty swiftly. Um, and I just created two more prompts to go with these readings, uh, the Lutz one is pretty quickly, pr pretty short. And I think we can move swiftly here, but it's there's some good stuff, I think, to get a handle on. All right, so both of these readings would, I, I would say, at least begin within that kind of serious man camp that we've been talking about so much. Whenever you find something, a, a piece of writing or, you know, an analysis that's bemoaning 
the loss of clarity of thought, of speaking that's bemoaning, the kind of the messiness of our language and the messiness of our thinking, that's very concerned about the consequences of misstating things and not getting things right. And, and um, there's usually some uh, reference to a lack of courage. Um, like we, we, are, we're, we, we lack the ability to say things plainly because we're trying to be either deceptive or nice thoughtful or we're just trying to like float our egos or whatever but if we had courage that that language of manliness is always kind of like cuts through the the serious man stuff um so we have a pretty good sense of like at least where we're starting and i think that you know w w with some sm minor exceptions we'll see that once again we're dealing with kind of serious man stuff here but they're drawing attention to a phenomenon that's pretty uh, I would say almost like universal, right? So it's worth thinking about at least. All right, so Lutz and doublespeak. Doublespeak, the key thing to note here um, is that doublespeak for Lutz is a form of, of sophistry, basically. And if you go back to even like Aristotle and, and the ancient rhetorical um, theorists and those who were writing about rhetoric for the first time and really thinking it through, for most most of the statements back in the ancient context would would suggest that sophistry is not just getting things wrong but deliberately getting things wrong right it's like you know the difference between what you're saying as as being misleading and then the truth that actually exists right so it's a choice sophistry is is knowing better but going down a path because you're so desperate to achieve some kind of outcome that you must engage in these deceptive practices, right? And that's basically what, what Lutz is saying about doublespeak. So on the bottom of that first page, 347, doublespeak is language that pretends to communicate, but really doesn't. It is language that makes the bad seem good. This is a classic definition of sophistry, making the worst case appear the better, right? That makes bad language seem good, the negative appear positive, unpleasant appear attractive or at least tolerable. Doublespeak is language that avoids or shifts responsibility, language that is at variance with its real or purported meaning. It is language that conceals or prevents thought rather than extending thought, doublespeak limits it, right? So it's a kind of form of deception and control if you're kind of just expanding a little bit. Um, and therefore, why not be very concerned about, you know, where it is and what it's doing to us. The very next thing he says is doublespeak is not a matter of subjects and verbs agreeing. It is a matter of words and facts agreeing. This is key. The basic to doublespeak is an incongruity, the incongruity between what is said or left unsaid and what really is. That's classic serious man kind of concern, right? There's the real, there's the real, what, the, what is actually the case, and then there's our language and again, as we've said many times, the job of language for the serious man is to correspond to that real thing. And to the extent that it does not, it is failing and it is lacking courage and conviction and clarity and clear thinking and, and all the rest, right? Um, so he continues here. It is the incongruity between the word and the referent, between seem and be between the essential function of language communication and what doublespeak does, mislead, distort, deceive, inflate, circumvent, obfuscate, right? So he makes a point of pointing out a few times here that if we're confused or if we're saying things in a kind of euphemistic way to be kind out of like concern for the well-being of others, that's not doublespeak because it's kind of coming from a good place or at least a, maybe an ignorant place, right? But when the motivation is to kind of get around a problem and to avoid clear headedness just because you're you're timid or or you're trying to get something past an audience or um, someone you're talking to. Um, if if the motivation is any one of these, then obviously we're in the realm of doublespeak, right? Um, so he's asking some questions here in the next little section. You can identify double speak just by answering questions. Who is saying what to whom? Under what conditions and circumstances? That's interesting. With what intent and with what results, right? So like thinking about context, really, getting back to general semantics stuff. I think it was Hayakawa. Context matters for trying to understand the why, the what, and the how, 
right? So like, here I am talking to you, what's my goal? I'm trying to inform and educate and clarify, hopefully. Um, what are the conditions and circumstances? Well, I'm doing this in a video because of the COVID pandemic and da 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 da. So hopefully, um, trying to sort of make a, a, a lecture video in a short and pithy way. Um, that's the intent with what results, uh, who knows, hopefully learning, hopefully engagement, hopefully better understanding, right? Um, but you can sort of apply those questions to any given exchange and you might unearth some idio uh, incongruities as he was saying before, right? All right, so he goes through, I think it's four different kinds of doublespeak. And my guess is a lot of this stuff's going to be familiar to you, but he's just sort of adding his own little twist, right? So euphemisms um, are words or language that softens, it abstracts. We've talked about abstraction, right? And so we don't die, we pass on, or we are, we are lost. I'm sorry that you lost your, right? Lost. Um, so there are words that we use that help us kind of like somewhat kind of get around unpleasantness, right? The usual examples come from war, you know, civilian casualties, or what do they call them? Um, um, yeah, casualties of war or something like this. These are people who've been like bombed destroyed villages and so on right so there's a, a weakening of the effect there's a kind of softening of of the reality of the message that's euphemism um an inoffensive or positive word or phrase used to avoid a harsh unpleasant or distasteful reality yeah so it's softening because we don't want to like deal with things basically and so you can find this like with way corporations talk about stuff that's going on that's nasty or politicians talking about stuff that's nasty or, you know, war stuff. It's not pleasant or parents talking to kids, trying to like soften things, you know. Um, we all kind of do this, I think, to some degree or other because we don't always want to just like destroy other people, right? But when we're doing it as a way of like avoiding culpability, that's a, that's a different story and, and that's where we land in doublespeak land. All right, second kind of doublespeak is jargon. Um, sort of technical, specialized language that if you have access to this specialized language, you can use it as like, I think of it like smokescreen. Um, and I see this a lot in academia because, you know, we're the ones who come up with so many of these terms. And, and if you have expertise and you come up with a term that someone else doesn't know, now you have a little leverage over them, right? It's like, oh, you didn't know? So <laughs> there's a lot of that. I came home, I uh, came up to the uh, the bedroom a few nights ago, and my, my wife was on the couch watching this movie from like 15 years ago. It was called Smart People. And she was, she was like kind of smirking because it was about this English professor. Um, and he ends up like getting into a relationship with a woman who was a student of his like many years ago. And he had, he's this like jerky like blowhard, arrogant English professor who's really smart, but he's also like kind of got a rotten soul. He's miserable. His wife died. He's arrogant. He's he's just like not a happy guy. And he kinds of like just th like lords his knowledge over people and lords his language over people. So he's out on this first date with this former student. She's now a doctor and she treats him. And so they like connect and they go out for dinner. And he spends like 45 minutes just like, well, the ontological, and and she's just sitting there like, she knows what he's doing, right? He's insecure. He hasn't been on a date in a long time. So instead of actually asking genuine human questions, he's just sort of like sitting back as though he's in his office hours and like opining on things and, and throwing out his vocabulary. And it's almost like this standard academic defense thing of like, I don't want to be challenged here, so I'm just going to create a smoke screen of language that you don't understand, and that's going to get me out of it. Lutz is calling that whole kind of motive and that, that process jargon-related doublespeak. Um, he says in that second paragraph, it's pretentious, it's obscure, it's esoteric, um, and its function is usually to impress or intimidate or obscure, or like create distance between. Um, so jargon and technical language, uh, in, in you know, most respects, it's necessary for a certain kind of enterprise. We've talked about language games, I think, in this class, did we? Got my, all my classes confused. Maybe not. Um, 
but you can think of technical language as just part of a, a, a certain kind of like localized language game, right? It's like if we're involved in some pursuit together and if we're digging deep into the, the intricacies of what we're doing, we're going to probably come up with new words to describe certain phenomenon, right? Because of that, that detail and that delicacy that's required. And so I personally don't have any problem with technical language if it's helping us understand and cooperate around a phenomenon. But when you take that technical language and you start like thrusting it at people as a way to get around talking to them in, in a real way, that's that's a, that's more of a problem and that's what he's getting at here. Um, so be careful about, you know, using technical language. Here we are as students in the academy. We're learning new terms all the time. I used to jokingly say to my students, the real reason you come and, and spend all this money for a degree is to, to impress your friends at cocktail parties with the words that you've learned, right? And so you just walk up with your cocktail and you start throwing out ontology and throw out like, you know, ideology and uh, ratio, whatever you want to just like, well, and everyone's like, oh, wow, you must have an uh, expensive degree. You must know a lot, right? And so it can, <laughs> it can produce this kind of mystifying effect. Um, a third kind of double speak is just a slightly broader category of jargon, this business of gobbledygook, gobbledygook or bureaucraties. Basically, such double speak is simply a matter of piling on words, of overwhelming an audience with words, right? And so this is not necessarily unique to a kind of special technical area. Um, it's just a matter of kind of like using words um, in the absence of, of any other kind of um, hard, reliable way of conveying an idea, right? And so it's, it's weakness of thought. It is maybe laziness. It is maybe panic. It's maybe some sense of guilt. Um, so at the bottom of 350, sometimes gobbledygook may sound impressive, but when the quote is later examined in print, it just doesn't make sense, right? And so it's sort of like piling up of meaningless uh, words. And, and a lot of this stuff corresponds with Orwell, as we'll see quickly here. Uh, the fourth kind of double speak is inflated language. Now, this is where I think we want to be thinking about a, the, the business of abstraction. Um, that's part of this, right? Uh, and sort of amplification and distortion for effect. Um, my son is the king of, of amplification, of hyperbole, right? Everything is like dialed up max in terms of like how good something is or how bad something is or how like crazy something is or whatever. It's always like, ah, did you see that? You know, <laughs> so inflated language is like, you got to be on guard. Like when your kid's telling you a story, it's like this was the, the most whatever, whatever, ever. Or it's like... Hold on a sec. If so, I got to go call the fire department. Are we talking, is that really accurately reflecting what actually happened? Or are you just trying to get the biggest possible response? I actually asked him one time, I was like, hey man, why do you use so much exaggeration when you talk? And he's just like, I just really want to make sure my point comes across. I want to be heard. I want the impact of what I'm saying to really, really land. He's a dramatic guy. And so it's always like, do you get it? Are you with me? You know, um, but there's a distortion because, you know, sure enough, if you go check what he's talking about, it's like not a big deal. So inflated language designed to make the ordinary seem extraordinary, to make everyday things seem impressive, okay? Obviously advertising, claims that are, you know, way outstrip reality, um, campaigning, political campaigning, like my goodness, all the promises, all this highfalutin language. Um, where else do we see this? Oh, I hate to say it, but social media, there's a lot of like, let's be impressive, let's exaggerate, let's amplify stuff. Um, in fact, you might even think of social media platforms as, in terms of their like basic, basic function is amplification, right? And so there's always this sort of energy of like bigness, bigness of, of statement, bigness of the thing that's happening here. There's always this attempt to kind of turn up the volume. That's how you get meme quality. That's how you become viral is that big punchy effect. Like the biggest impact with the littlest kind of input is, is sort of the, the model there. Um, so that's kind of it, gang. He has some final stuff on like ways of asking questions to avoid these kinds of things. Uh, let's see, gobbledygook inflated language. It's only ever double speak number eight on the prompt here when it is intended to deceive. That's important. Designed to distort. 
Error, confusion, a sincere but misguided effort to use language impressively. Those aren't, that's not doublespeak. That's just maybe a little bit, um, I don't know, uh, being a little bit indulgent or lazy or weak in some certain, in some circumstances. So he's not saying like every occasion where we find language that's inflated is doublespeak lying deception. Um, so we need to be thinking about motive. We need to be thinking about the intent, the intent, the intention or the intended, uh, purpose of a, of, a, of a message, a statement, and then lining that up with the language use and thinking about the context and what else might be going on, right? So, you know, hopefully being in this class is making you a little more um, attentive and sensitive to the kind of stuff that's going on out there. Um, I think we see a lot of this stuff, the amplification stuff, the, um, the euph euphemism stuff, it's pretty common. So, uh, I don't know, see if you can s sort of spot this stuff as you're just going about your, your business. With that, we're already at 20 minutes here, so I'll do this quick. Um, the Orwell stuff is very similar. Now, again, he's writing this in 68, so we're going back about 30 years, around three decades, and he's talking more in English context, and, of course, the American is based largely on English English, uh, British English, and so they're the kind of owners of the language, and... Uh, you know, if you talk to an English person, there's just like, you always feel inferior because they have just more kind of command of their own language. And Americans go off and they create all these y'alls and, you know. Um, and so it always seems more impressive to talk or listen to an English person speak. And he's very concerned about his own brethren and their tendencies for obfuscation and, you know, bad thinking. And what, really what I want to point out here. Um, because the examples that he gives are very similar to Lutz, but I, I'm interested in the in his sort of framing of the problem. And it reminds me a lot of what I was saying uh, in the videos for Kenneth Burke, especially on terministic screen and oc occupational psychosis. This idea, I think terministic screen mostly, um, this idea that our language kind of filters how it is that we see and understand the world, and it also shapes it in the same way. So it's both a reflection and... Um, a, a constituting of our engagement with the external world, right? So he's saying here in, uh, in, in, the, in the second prompt, I note, we saw this with Burke in the terministic screen. Our language becomes ugly and inaccurate. This is quoting Orwell. Our language becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language in turn makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts, right? So the bad thinking leads to the bad speaking, but then the language itself, because now it's sort of external to our brains, it can has its own kind of agency and a bad agency at that because other people start talking this way and then they start thinking this way and it perpetuates the problem in a kind of cyclical manner. That's the basic dynamic that I was trying to draw out with Burke and terministic screens, right? The thing that is selecting is also deflecting. And it's all kind of having this circular relationship between language and thought, right? Our, our language expresses our thought, but our thoughts are also shaped by our language, right? So it's like this constantly. Um, so Orwell, again, is a kind of serious man, uh, although there's some tweaks in here. But he's a serious man in the sense that he is concerned about clear thinking and he's concerned about the lack of clear expression of ideas in language, right? So if you're looking at language and the way that your brethren, your, your colleagues, your compatriots are writing, they're writing their reports, they're writing their essays, they're writing their novels... Um, short stories, fiction, nonfiction, right? The world, mostly nonfiction, though. He's, he's most interested in political speech, political writing. And he's seen just a lot of what he thinks is just bad, messy, confused, weak, lazy, pretentious language use. And that's concerning him because, of course, that means messy thinking, right? So he wants to clean up language as a way to also clean up thought, I don't know which one comes first necessarily, but he kind of wants both, right? Um, so in 128, he says, to think clear clearly is a necessary first step toward political regeneration. So if we get our language better, then we'll get our thoughts better, and then we'll get our politics better. We can't have good political action if it's rooted in bad thinking and bad talking, okay? So for him, it's like big consequence here. The reason our politics are so crap is because our language is crap, because our thoughts are crap, right? So let's clean it up. That's the serious man hope, is tidy. Where I think he becomes a slightly less serious man and a little bit of rhetoric man is that he's all 
he's all hip to the idea of inventing words. In fact, the, the first one he's troubled by is um, the example of the problem here is like dying metaphors. Um, or the, the the fourth one, meaningless words. A lot of this stuff is basically him, his frustration is with like a lot of lazy, thoughtless, just kind of like grabbing phrases just because you're too lazy to come up with something sharper. So his interest in sharpness and, and sort of a vivid imagery and a vivid way of speaking, I think has a little bit of rhetoric man in it because there's, there's an inventional quality that he's yearning for. He's not just saying like, look, all the language we need is perfectly around us. You just need to be better at selecting. He's saying, no, go ahead and be artistic. But your artistry needs to be focused on precision, clarity, getting things right. So he's more troubled by this kind of like, I don't know, I think about like a waste dump. You know, it's like all this waste gets thrown in and then more on top of it. And over time, it just kind of piles up and piles up. And he's basically saying like, we have all these like old, useless, pretentious, dead phrases, metaphors, just like... It's just been around for so long and too many of our writers are just grabbing, sort of lazily grabbing at this expression and that expression and this cliche. And it's like, come on, wake up, like do the job of trying to communicate with purpose. I think that's his general point here. So it's a serious man kind of place that he begins because he's concerned about lack of clarity, lack of integrity, lack of courage and all that kind of stuff. But he's also embraces some artistry, an inventional artistry, which is a little bit of that rhetoric man stuff, the poetics, right? Like the creation, the newness. But for him, it's got to do the job of like correctly conveying the truth and reality of a, of a situation. Um, that's largely not too bad, really. I, I've got plenty of uh, comments drawing your attention to specific moments in here. Um, the examples that he gives are, are pretty well correspond with, uh, with Lutz's examples. Um, preten pretentiousness would go along with Lutz's uh, jargon and gobbledygook, right? Dying metaphors doesn't really go into Lutz's too much. Um, maybe euphemism, but dying metaphors is like just tired old expressions, you know? Um, that's, that gets in a little bit with Burke's, um literature as equipment for living, right? It's like we use these phrases, these sort of, they can become cliches or a little bit tired. And and what's interesting is if you go through these examples in here, they're not going to be familiar to us at all because they're they're older. And they're and in this case, they're particular to England, right? So a lot of this stuff is like, this isn't dead to us. This is, this is ancient. This is gone, right? And so it's nice to think that like language hasn't evolved, in fact, beyond this. Um, and it does anyway. It always moves. It's dynamic. It's always on the move. But we, you know, we as users and wielders of language are, we're not 100% actively like, boop, boop, like pop, pop, pop. I need to be consciously thinking about every single word and phrase. And so we just sort of like, you know, naturally kind of grab things as we go. It's like this phrase, that expression, that example. Um, so we draw on a lot of, of, Stuff that I think Orwell would be thinking, it's old, it's tired, it's worn out. Like, let's come up with more lively, fresh, sharp ways of saying things that really convey uh, the truth of, of reality in clear, vivid, sharp, fresh ways. Right? Um, and at the end, Orwell also proposes a few... Uh, prescriptions for like how we can avoid this in ourselves and how we can spot it else out, um, out there in the wild. Um, we, he says on number 11 on the prompt, we need to be constantly on guard, right? So this is this business of pers our environments as persuasive. If you think about our kind of verbal environments, our, our representational environments, the world that are pseudo environments in, in uh, Lippmann's sense, the world as it's kind of coming to us mediated by language, by reports, by stories, by essays, by speeches, by campaigns, by ads, all the rest of it, right? All of that stuff would be considered verbal or representational and not hard objective reality. And yet our encounters with the extensional world are primarily mediated through these kinds of of vehicles, language, screens, words, images, and so on. And their point is most of it is distorted. Most of it could be considered um, 
either double speak or um, I don't know if he comes if Orwell has it an exact term here, but just bad bad language, <laughs> ugly, ugly and bad language, right? So um, once again, it is it is a dream. It is this dream of serious man that we can ever get to a place of like perfect neutrality and, and our language is like always reflecting exactly just the information that needs to be reflected. At one point, Orwell even says toward the end, he's like, we would be better off just avoiding words altogether and just trying to get as much information as we can through images and sounds and so on. It's like, wow, that's how much he's concerned about the distorting power of words and language. All right, so it's a dream of serious man to live in this kind of angelic realm where we know everything and we're able to perfectly communicate that to one another. Uh, it's Burke, it was Kenneth Burke who said uh, angels would have no need for language, right? Because everything could just be perfectly known and expressed. We have to sort of try our best to convey our motives and our and our interests and ideas and, and, and ideals through this imperfect medium. Um, so there's going to be lots of problems. There's always going to be lots of problems. And, that, you know, we should not em just be chill with the fact that language can lead us down paths and do all these problematic things. But this idea that we can, if we can just clear our, our language, then we'll clear up our thoughts and then politics will be better and we'll all be singing and dancing. It's like, no, I'm sorry. Like, we can try to get more, you know, sturdier engagements with one another we can try our best to like um uh have better motives and maybe calling out bad motives and these kinds of things so this stuff's useful but we need to be cautious that if we do all this perfectly we're gonna you know end up in the land of perfect understanding all right so i'll be curious to know what you guys think about you know these kinds of examples if there's others that you think if you wonder that you know whether these are so bad as infractions um, these guys were pretty concerned. Orwell was quite concerned. And I still see a lot of stuff on the social media's platforms. People who still cite Orwell and this essay in particular to this day are those who are generally more conservative, um, who are very concerned about all the new language that's happening on the left and the, the progressive side of things. And they usually sort of invoke this essay as like, everything's going to hell because of all this new language use, right? Well, it's not so simple. I think one of the things that we've talked about in this class is the fact that like the progressives, the left side of the political spectrum, tend to be a little more young, tend to be like more city folk, generally speaking, right? That's where a lot of new language, again, the university, the academy, more progressive. That's where a lot of terms get invented because trying to keep up with the changing nature of reality itself. And then those terms get out there in the wider world. And then Typically speaking, conservatives, those who are more conservative, who tend to like things as they are, that's conservative, right? It's like, we don't need to constantly be inventing because we have the language, we have the ways of thinking about things. So it's kind of a political thing, right? Progressives tend to invent, conservatives tend to defend that against that which has been invented, and on we go and on we go and on we go. So there is, I think, something to be said about, you know, just wildly inventing new terms that don't need to be invented or just like creating all this kind of heat and smoke for what reason, right? Whereas the conservatives need to maybe chill out on the fact that language is never going to give us this perfect utopia of clarity that, that they're hoping for, right? So let's work together and let's try to clarify our motives and, and deal with one another as best we can. Um, language is not going to solve any problem on its own one way or the other, right? It's all of us together using it. Nevertheless, there's some interesting and useful um, tidbits in here. And so there you go. Double speak and abuses of language. And then we're going to continue on with more environmental challenges. So see you soon.